Hey, everybody, welcome uh, to our presentation tonight. This is Ed Friedman. Um, I chair Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, this is the 27th year we've been doing this. And I'm going to go through some slides about who we are, what we do quickly. And people are still coming in. We have a lot of people registered tonight. So um, if we have, if you have questions during the night, you can use the chat feature on the Zoom program and put them in there. And uh, Martin and I will kind of moderate them uh, at the end of the program and we'll, we'll uh, see what we can do to answer them. Um, anyone who, who is, uh, has their speaker or uh, is not muted, like that would be me and you, Joe and Martin, make sure, please make sure our phones or things like that are off. Uh, we are recording, folks, so if you don't want to be recorded, this is your chance to leave. And uh, if you know of anyone who, who might like to uh, listen to the presentation uh, but couldn't make it tonight, we should have it posted on our website within a couple of a few days. Thanks to Martin McDonough, who is here and who is our technical uh, advisor here and volunteer on, on, on the program. So... Um, start off slide here, picture of Joe Kelly, our speaker, and, and the other slide of the day, just um, for, for those that might catch it, is, is, is a slide I pulled from our current study that we did over multiple years and just shows the influence, or the, the governing influence that this bedrock constriction the CHOPS has on the bay and water flows and, and there for sediment deposition as well. So it's sort of the, the geology connection. Um, Moving on here, you see the duck slide, Martin? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so we're we are one of the one of the few groups that takes a holistic look at the at the, the environment here, and uh, we do research, we do advocacy work, um, we do land conservation, we protect a lot of land, and we do educational work with kids. Uh, a few slides here that I'm um, trying to go through the areas here. Um, I'm not going to go through all this. We do a lot of work with bald eagles, a lot of uh, work on uh, toxins in the environment, working a lot with PFAS right now. Um, been doing water quality for years and years. And we try and let our, uh, our research inform our advocacy. Look in here. There we go. Advocacy. Um, yeah, so we, a lot of fish restoration work. You can see some grizzly pictures here of uh, fish that have encountered hydroelectric turbines. Don't let anybody fool you. Uh, hydroelectricity is not very green, especially large hydro. Um, Martin, if you could admit folks, there you go, thank you. Um, so working with the Brunswick Sewage District right now on PFAS, getting into the uh, Androscoggin River. We upgraded the Androscoggin River, the lower river, after many, many years, um, showing that it was meeting with the next last classification. Um, education has been a um, somewhat on hold over the years because of COVID uh, in an active way. And finally, this fall, we had um, something like 250 uh, fourth graders from seven schools back at an outdoor bay day, and it was wonderful. The return of Bay Day, kind of featured in our most recent newsletter, which is online if you didn't get it. And we've protected at this point well over 1,500 acres of land, uh, largely valuable wildlife habitat. Our focus is on wildlife rather than you know, people and recreation because there is plenty of that. Uh, again, if you missed, uh, if someone missed tonight's presentation or you want to watch it again, we are recording, and if you go down the home page of our website at friendsofmerrymeanybay.org or f1b.org, uh, scroll down to education on the right side, you'll see a speaker series video link there, and you can find us there, find Joe there. The rest of the season um, series here, I want to really recommend um, the, pr the program for January. Uh, um, Becca Peixoto, uh, field archaeologist, and she's done most of her work in the Great Dismal Swamp of Virginia and North Carolina, and also was one of an elite group to be down in the uh, the Rising Star Caves in South Africa, where 
um, remains of 250,000 year old um, hominids were, were found. So that should be pretty interesting. And so I'll introduce Joe and hand the screen over to him when I'm done here. Uh, but Joe, Joe Kelly's a main, uh, main native, born in Portland, attended Shepherd's High School. He went on to get a BS in geology at, at Boston University and then his uh, master's and PhD uh, degrees in geology at Lehigh University. Uh, Joe's first professional position was as an assistant professor at the University of New Orleans. And he returned to Maine in 1982 as the state marine geologist with the Maine Geological Survey. In 1999, he joined the University of Maine as a professor of marine geology, where he worked for the next 20 years. And I've got to say that we started our speaker series about 27 years ago. Um, the second season of our series, uh, um, Joe gave a presentation on the geology of the bay, December of 1997. So welcome back, Joe. And uh, I know you and I have changed a, a bunch, but I don't know that the geology has changed a whole lot. So we'll, but we'll hear we'll hear what's new and what you've been up to. And I'm going to stop sharing now and let you share your screen. Uh, it says that I'm sharing. Well, we're only seeing like uh, a horizontal slice of your slide. There you go. There's the slide, but not the slide show. So we're seeing your thumbnails. There you go. Full screen of, of your. Is that it? Yep. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, well, here's just an air photo of Mary Meeting Bay. Uh, it's not a well studied bay. I'll say that as a caveat before we get into this very much. And I found that out the first day I was going there to do some work. I use geophysical equipment to map the seabed and what's beneath it, all the layers and geological history. Um, but I got stuck in a sandbar right at the beginning and realized the bay was way too shallow for my boat and my equipment. So I never returned and, and no one else has done that sort of work yet either. But we'll go into what we can find out about the geology of the bay. I mean, it's an interesting area, it's unique really. I'll just start advancing with these slides now. Because okay. it doesn't want me to advance. Sometimes, sometimes if it doesn't advance, you've got to click on your mouse separately and then you can That's, go back to using your arrow. You're right. Oh. I remember. Okay. So here we are. Here's the main coast. And uh, I named it different uh, names when I was first coming here to work because these areas are uh, quite different from one another, but internally sort of consistent. And I'll go through that just to get a sense for where um, Merry Meeting Bay lies. You can see it circled in red there in my crude illustration of the main coast. Um, down here in the southernmost part of the state, you can see the geological map on the left. The colors represent different ages of rocks, the patterns, different kinds of materials. The checked ones there, you see the blue one and the yellow one that says C1 and the red ones, those were all molten rocks. We call them igneous rocks. And they dominate a lot of the, the headlands and the higher areas uh, in Southern Maine. All of the other rocks uh, are metamorphic. They were layered sedimentary or volcanic rocks, and they've subsequently been heated uh, and, and altered quite a bit since that time. You can see a typical picture of that part of the, the coastline, a rocky granite island sticking out with a beach behind it and a marsh, very much what that part of the coast is like. Here we'll talk about tonight, um, it was, I, I called it the indented shoreline because there's so many prominent estuaries. Um, <clears throat> you can see the different colors of the rocks. Again, the, the, the checked ones, the blue ones off to the right and the the pale whitish one off near Sebago Lake are granites and granite type bodies. Um, the rest are uh, layered rocks. They're metamorphic rocks, altered, mostly altered sedimentary rocks. You can see in this that the, there's a trend of the rock, which way these rocks are, are, are not horizontal like you, what you might see at the Grand Canyon. They've been altered profoundly they were squeezed, most of the layers, I mean, stand up vertically and descend into the earth. And the orientation even changes as you go from Casco Bay, you can see the Northeast orientation or trend of the rocks. And then these black lines that you notice, 
throughout here are faults. They're old faults. They're not active at all today, but they were active and they moved materials into juxtaposition with one another. They had no business being with one another. They, they formed in different parts of the world. Um, every rock you see in this image, with the exception of the granites, formed remotely from where we are today and were assembled by processes that I'll mention in a minute that tended to bring blocks of rock uh, together. Once brought together, this was a very high mountain range, similar to the Himalayas, but that was 400 million years ago, and it has been reduced to a what we see today, a much lower area. We're looking very far down into the earth, perhaps about seven miles below what was the surface of the earth. So the rocks here are have been heated up tremendously, and, and we'll, uh, we'll see that. Just a couple pictures from the indented shoreline, the, the edge of it here near Cape Elizabeth, the points sticking out are all rocks that we call, they weren't sandstones, we call them quartzites today, very resistant to erosion, so they stand out as promontaries. The rocks in between would have been mudstones, um, and they've all been eroded more because they are less, uh, uh, less strong. On the right side, it's just looking down, I think that's a sheep's gut estuary. Long, so the, the orientation change gives us very different rock types. I mean, here on the indented shoreline on the, on the right, you see all the mud flats and, and there are salt marshes. On the left, the much more exposed Casco Bay shoreline is very rocky with, with gravelly beaches. Moving up the coast to the Island Bay area, all these blue checked rocks you see there are granite bodies. Um, the colored areas are, geologists generalize them and say they're terrains. These are parts of continents uh, that have been broken up, reassembled. Now they're reassembled in Maine. You see lots of black lines. Those are all faults. Um, a very, uh, very complicated area, the, among the most complicated in the state, uh, over at Islesboro Island. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, but over in this area and down here in Rockland, um, there are slivers of uh, a limestone that was cut into by a, a granite-like rock. That rock can't date the limestone, but we could date the granite, and it was 640 million years ago that it formed, meaning that the layered rocks, the limestone of Rockland and Islesboro is, is much, much older. Um, the granites themselves um, represent a molten body of rock that erupted as a volcano. The, the granite never got to the surface, so the crystals sat there and had time to crystallize into big grains that you can see when you hold and look at a rock. Um, but these are the cores of, of, of volcanoes, and looking at Mount Desert Island there, um, that was, it's termed a super volcano, more than a thousand cubic kilometers, cubic, like a, a cube, three sides, a thousand uh, kilometers long, I mean, was emitted when that erupted. That's a super volcano, very big. As an example, uh, Mount St. Helens, which erupted in Oregon and, or in Washington in 1987, was one point, I think it was 1.3 uh, cubic kilometers. So these are these are beyond, if, if these things erupted today, we'd be dead. Uh, the, the earth couldn't endure these kind of eruptions. We'll hope they don't reoccur. Finally, if you go up to the down east coast, where few ever really visit, um, you can see on the left uh, the geological map. Again, these blue, formerly uh, molten bodies that underlay volcanoes are prominent there. Some of the volcanic rocks are the greens and, and, and yellows you can see along the coast. Uh, and there's some deep water uh, mud, mud rocks in there. These are out here, this dash line is a fault line, our fault lines. Um, and this area is seismically active, although there's been no rupture of the surface. Um, they get they get frequent. I mean, every year there are a handful of earthquakes, small ones. The largest earthquake in Maine was in Eastport in, I think, 1905. So uh, a little background. Um, so that's the coast. I, I mentioned words. I, I, I want to really make sure I make one thing clear. Molten rocks make up much of the Maine coast, and I showed where some of those granites are. But the other kind of material, uh, you see how it forms here in A on the upper left, you can see the deep sea Gulf of Maine a picture I took from a submersible in about 200 feet of water um, a number of years ago. It's mud, it's very soupy with some shells. 
Well, let it get buried 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, and it will become a sedimentary rock like the picture to the right, which is uh, taken from the Stillwater River outside my house. And you can see dark and light alternating layers. The dark are mud. Each one of those dark bands probably took oh, tens of thousands of years to accumulate very slowly. The sand, the yellow, uh, the lighter colored ones were underground, underwater landslides that probably happened in a few hours. So that's the way geological outcrops are. But that's sedimentary rock. It's not really sedimentary. It has been altered, but it's, it's still, you can see layers where ripples pass through. Finally, on the lower left over here, um, metamorphic rock, altered, changed shape rock. Um, so it was a sedimentary rock. It was sediment once, but it has been heated up. This is the Ellsworth Formation. And uh, the lighter layers, uh, mostly minerals, quartz, and feldspar, <clears throat> became plastic at as it started to get too hot. And they began to, to lose their strength, and they began to just kind of not really flow, but just bend, and, and everything else kind of bent with them. Very classic example of the Ells Ellsworth Formation and metamorphic rocks in general. So we have sediments, and, and we'll talk about some in Merry Meeting Bay. We don't really have sedimentary rocks to speak of much anymore, but we have a lot of metamor mostly metamorphic rocks in the state. Here's a map of the metamorphic history of the state, and you can, or not the history, but the, the rock types, the hot colors, the reds and oranges, were the highest temperatures reached, mostly down in southern Maine, again, representing at least seven miles of burial beneath uh, overlying layers of sand and mud. The gray are all the igneous rocks, the molten rocks. Um, <clears throat> when I was a student, it was once, it was wondered whether these were the end result of the heating. In other words, you heated the rocks, you altered them, and then some melted. Since then, we've come to realize, no, that's not the case. These gray things you see are the granites were injected vertically through the Earth's crust um, after these other layered rocks were there and after they were, um, after they were heated. Um, there are sedimentary rocks. I should just mention them. Some up here in Aristic County, just north of Baxter State Park, and over here along the, uh, the, the border with Canada, uh, the Perry Formation in Perry, Maine. But most of the state overwhelmingly are metamorphic rocks. What that tells a geologist is this area of land has been caught up in continental collisions. Uh, some of the rocks, um, here you see the Cape Elizabeth Formation uh, on the left is uh, at Two Lights uh, State Park. And it's it's all it's no longer a, a sedimentary rock. It's folded, um, and it, and it's obviously a rock, but it's a low grade metamorphic rock. If you go in the direction that rock trends across the bay to Booth Bay Harbor, you see at the lower right that's the same formation, and you can see now it is the 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 white the 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 quartz rich layers had begun to deform. They were just they were just it was just too hot for them. They couldn't uh, endure the load that had been placed on them. Uh, that was a geological field trip when we went there to, to look at those, those rocks. So same formation, but different depth of burial and different degree of alteration. So what caused the alteration? Well, um, <clears throat> this is a map of the tectonic plates. These are blocks of the Earth's crust and a little bit down into the Earth, the next layer down, the mantle. Um, and there, there are others, but this is the, the largest ones. And uh, they move. They move because of convection, heat-driven movement beneath the rigid crust of the Earth. So you can see some of the arrows on them. Where, in, in the sense, they're moving. There we are in the North America plate, very safe in the middle of a plate, just where you want to be. Not on the edge of a plate where the plates interact with one another and can cause earthquakes and volcanoes. So the boundaries of those plates uh, are really kind of where it's at. Uh, we see spreading centers like the mid-ocean ridge in the middle of the Atlantic where new crust is formed. It wells up from below and it begins to move out. Um, <clears throat> when that was first discovered by I mainly Bruce Hazen at uh, Lamont Doherty, that's all we'd really come to learn about the, um, about the Earth's tectonics. And he saw this and understood what it meant and said, well, he concluded the earth was getting bigger because it was spreading. We're getting more crust. And he actually went down to Princeton to give a talk on this subject. And he did. And in the audience was a man named Harry Hess, the man who really came to understand this. 
mentally taking notes because Harry had been a submarine commander in World War II and had been interested in deep sea trenches, which is what we find in subduction zones, areas where ocean crust created at spreading centers moves away from those centers, gets colder. If it gets colder, it gets denser. And when it gets dense, it sinks down beneath the lighter uh, crust of the continents. And as it gets down deep enough, you can see the red here, uh, it becomes molten and sets off volcanoes. The volcanoes almost invariably occur about 150 kilometers from what would be a deep sea trench, just in, in this case in the ocean. Um, so that's two ways to, to, to make the earth you know, active and how it can be uh, moving today. But it was realized early on by a Canadian uh, geologist, Tuzo Wilson, that that wasn't enough. Uh, the earth is spherical. and doesn't allow just those two kinds of motion. We needed something else. And that something else are called transform faults, faults where big blocks of the earth move past one another. Um, the San Andreas fault is probably the most famous, but we have paleo San Andreas faults, if you will, or transform faults. The Nuremberg fault, which cuts just behind the main coast, uh, was once this kind of uh, of a fault, and it moved large blocks of the of the of the coast coastal part of Maine into their present positions. Finally, there are things called hot spots or plumes, where um, a tectonic plate is moving in one direction, and this plume from near the Earth's core arises. Uh, eventually, it it gives forth little blebs of molten rock that form volcanoes that can form lines of volcanoes where the upper pl plate is moving and the plume, the hot spot, is not moving. There's presently a plume under uh, Hawaii, under Iceland, under um, Yellowstone National Park, and there's linear chains of volcanoes in, in all of those areas. You could do a whole course on, on this and, and you could never find 10 geologists who would agree with any, any part of it, but this is just a brief geological history of the state, of the rock history, and then we'll move on into some other things. On the top thing, a billion years ago or so, uh, continents came together and formed a large mountain chain. We call it the Grenville. Orogeny means a mountain building event. Um, but by 500 million years ago, um, it was trapping the heat that was trying to escape from the earth. It was an insulator. Continents are insulators. And as a result, the, the earth's crust was pushed upward and upward until it ruptured and then began to pull apart. Um, we call this, well, rifting post Grenville, meaning after this mountain building event. Um, another time we got to 480 or so million years ago, and we can see that the, the, the earlier mountains had formed some sedimentary layers here. This would be in Quebec today. Um, and a subduction zone uh, uh, had formed here in, wasn't the Atlantic Ocean, there was an ocean before the Atlantic, and an island, an Arcuid island chain like the Aleutians or Japan um, <clears throat> or Southeast uh, Indonesia was being moved toward uh, North America. And eventually here, uh, the Taconic orogeny, uh, it collided. Again, orogeny is a mountain building event and the collision led to a large chain of mountains, the Taconics, some of which are there. They're not very large anymore, but they, but they were back 428 million years ago. And then they began to erode, and they shed sediment onto the coastal zone. Meanwhile, uh, new subduction zones, two of them would form, <coughs> drawing Avalonia here. Again, a continental block, not the size of North America, but, but big. Uh, uh, size of Greenland, maybe, or something like that, and with volcanoes where there was subduction happening. And by about 390 million years ago, um, it had it had attached. And that is where much of Maine's coast is today, is, is this greenish material that was Avalonia. But it wasn't over. Um, <clears throat> Africa was moving, a new subduction zone opened up, and eventually it collided uh, it's given the name the Allegheny and Orogeny for where it's most prominently seen. Um, but it was a very large, the beginning of the Appalachian, really, this, this is the Appalachian Mountains forming. And you can see how each collision has, has really deformed all the layers before it, making it a hard jigsaw puzzle to figure out. Next on our last really major event on our list, um, was about 220 million years ago. Again, big continent, trapping a lot of heat from the Earth. Uh, leading to uplift of the earth and expansion. 
and the Atlantic Ocean began to form in the time of the of the of the dinosaurs. And again, all these 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 blocks that you see here are fault blocks that if you go to the Bay of Fundy or any of the they're called rift basins, uh, the Bay of Fundy, um, the Connecticut River Valley, Gettysburg Basin, the Richmond Basin, all these are basins with red sandstones, some some basalts, but these were where the Atlantic Ocean started to form, but didn't. It eventually did form, and it formed beneath what is now Georgia's bank, and we're being pushed away from Europe um, at about a centimeter or half an inch a year. Uh, and now you see the final, the cross section, all of these uh, these various uh, places. This would be New Jersey, probably, with a coastal plain. That's material weathered away from the mountains that used to be more prominent to the to the west. So we have these these maps, and we can I, we, you can look these up online. You can get them for any period of time, <clears throat> and what it shows is well what was what was going on um, when Maine formed as a state, you know, uh, as as a landmass rather about six hundred and fifty million years ago. We were down here near the South Pole, and you can see that there were you can see the names of the bear. Here's Alaska over here to the side of us. Laurentia is what we call uh, what would we call New England today, but but lots of, uh, of land masses, island arcs, subduction zones. By the middle Ordovician, things had moved. We had moved. We were at the equator now. It was uh, very warm, a lot of lime, well, yeah, limestone in the area, um, very different conditions. And then up here, the KT boundary, this is the end of the Cretaceous, the, the meteorite that uh, killed the dinosaurs. Um, we've moved quite a ways off. We're still not the way we are today, big inland seaway up here in the Western United States, a different geography, but coming, starting to look more friendly. I've been asked about a, <clears throat> probably every time I've ever given a talk on this, how do you know this? I mean, look at all the information on these, these illustrations. How can we know this? I even feel so confident that this is introductory textbook stuff. Well, I'll just say it very briefly, um, but anytime iron is melted, it loses its magnetic properties. So it's not magnetic anymore. But as it cools, it passes a temperature called the Curie point where it's cool enough now for iron to acquire a magnetic field. And iron crystals, iron minerals will, will do that. And so they will align themselves within the, the tiniest of crystals in rocks um, with the north part of the, of, the, of, the, of the mineral facing the North Pole. And if it's at the North Pole, it's also going looking straight down because that's where it would be pointing. If it's at the equator, it's pointing horizontally. So we can go out to any place we find iron-bearing rocks, collect a rock sample, and determine its paleo, meaning its ancient latitude, longitude, and age. And so I'm not saying it's easy to make these rocks, but the technique is simple enough that it's been done time immemorial um, for oh, 40 years at least. Um, and we have very good uh, reconstructions of what the earth was like. I might say driven in, in good part by oil companies who wanted to know where they might find petroleum forming at different times in the past. Okay, well, rocks. Um, I'm gonna move into glacial erosion and, and that was really the next thing after the rocks had formed in Maine. And since then, really, all we've done is erode. Uh, the rocks are eroding, eroding, eroding. Again, we're seven miles down in, in the Casco Bay area. Um, but then we started, a few million years ago, started getting um, ice ages. This is a picture of Reed Inlet in Glacier Bay, where I worked for uh, a couple of years ago. And um, you can see what it looks like. I, I used to have a figure. I couldn't find it for this talk, but I, I labeled this uh, Cadillac Mountain because this was what Cadillac Mountain would have looked like. Um, when the ice age was, when it was ending next, it was melting back, floating glaciers in deep water uh, with a rocky uh, mass. So this is just a, a, <clears throat> a cartoon, but all those points of data points <clears throat> that were dated and established the timing of when the ice was there or was more distant. And you can look on the upper left one, this is 15,000 uh, 500 years ago, and the ice is right near the main coast, uh, maybe just offshore. There is a few dates, there aren't a lot of dates, but you get the sense that the, the ice, which had once extended to Long Island, New York, and Martha's Vineyard, had retreated quite a way 
That was about 18,000 years ago in 3,000 or so years. And it continued to retreat across Maine. You can see in this middle panel and then up, in, up into finally into the edge of Canada. Notice on the lower left here though, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the ice is all over here, all over Quebec and in Maine, but it's melting here in the Gulf of St. Lawrence very quickly because the ice is floating and icebergs calve off and float away really quickly. So this is becoming a, <clears throat> an open water body and Maine is being cut off <clears throat> from the principal mass of what we call Laurentide ice, Canadian ice. And then by the middle panel here, we are cut off. So Maine is receiving uh, no ice coming down from Canada. And um, where there's just some residual small ice caps left mostly in Northern Maine, probably in Mount Katahdin area as, um, as the ice age for us was ending. Um, and then it continues to melt 12,000 years ago, it goes away. But at one point down here around 12,800 years ago, the ocean got down as far as Lake Champlain, a really large lake in Vermont, and it was marine for a brief period of time. And we can know that because a number of years ago, probably in the 18, early 1800s, <clears throat> a farmer was farming the shoreline around, um, uh, around the lake, and the lake had shrunk somewhat uh, since it, it, its, its high day, and, um, and he found a whale fossil. Now, what's a whale doing in Lake Champlain? It didn't make any sense to him. <clears throat> he, he assumed it was Noah's flood, and he donated it to the Vermont Natural History Museum, where it remains to this day, and it is the state fossil of Vermont. Um, so strange things have happened briefly, but at different times. Um, but certainly by 12,000 years ago, and it says calibrated dates. That means people dated tree rings with radiocarbon dating, and they could count the tree rings. We know how old the tree ring was exactly. And so now we can calibrate um, <clears throat> our radiocarbon dates. The radiocarbon date would have said 10,000.5 radiocarbon years, but calibrated years, 12,000 is, is, is more accurate. So coming over to Mary Meeting Bay, this is not the bedrock. This is the surficial geology. And... Um, there are a couple of units and I'll just talk about them. I won't spend much time on the A, that's the alluvial. That means the river deposits or S swamp deposits. Um, those are modern and pretty obvious, but the more interesting and, and more widespread uh, is this purple unit that you see here. And that's glacial marine mud. As the ice age ended, the ice weighed a great deal and pushed down on the earth's crust. It pushed the earth's crust down one foot for every three feet of ice. Now we know that Mount Katahdin was topped by the glacier, so it was 5,000 or so feet thick. So the, the crust of the earth was really pushed down, even though there was an ice age and there was plenty of ice on land up in Canada, um, <clears throat> the ice, the, the ocean flooded Maine, inland as far as uh, Medway, Millinocket area, and all of these coastal lowlands in this area were flooded. And, and what we find then is glacial marine mud, it has fossils that belong in well, Labrador and Greenland today, some modern fossils, but are modern kinds of fossils, but many of them don't no longer live in this area. <coughs> and then we have eskers, this red unit. Uh, when, we, when this map was made, there was a debate of what color this should be. Red's a prominent color. These were small units, long skinny stretches, and it was thought that would be the best color. Um, eskers are ice tunnel deposits. So when there was a glacier around, um, it was melting and water went down into what are called moulins, big holes on the surface of the ice where water descends and eventually it acquires a great deal of velocity. It's, it's maybe descending half a mile and it, it comes out uh, at the other end out of an ice tunnel. But as it travels, it leaves a deposit uh, called an esker, which is a sand and, and gravel deposit. They are excavated as quarries all, all over the state. Um, you can see a faint blue line, which I tried to mimic over here on the right, as a moraine trace. A moraine is a place where the glaciers paused for a while, often quite a while. Um, glaciers always move forward, but they melt when they get too far into too, too warm an area. Um, and you can reach a point where they reach a balance. They're advancing forward at the same rate they're retreating backward. And so they, they bring the material to a point and they leave it and form a, uh, a moraine, a, a ridge 
Well, some can be quite high, uh, more than 100 feet. <laughs> Excuse me. It can extend laterally for, for miles. But these are mostly in the subsurface. They're covered by uh, the later glacial marine mud. So you, you can see them maybe along outcrops on the bay, but not so much on the surface as you would see them on the surface over in these other areas where um, other glacial materials are indicated. So um, we have a bay that's surrounded by muddy deposits. You might think it will be a muddy bay, but of course we know um, it is not. Uh, I had a slide on moraines. It's just on the right hand, on the lower right hand side, it's an air photo of the Sedgwick moraines. Each one of these, again, was the edge, the margin of where the ice was for a year, 10 years. We don't have any way to really date it that carefully. Some think these were annual features. Um, they're very prominent. You can see this this one right here is seen in this picture up here. Um, it's, you know, five or six feet above the surrounding area. <clears throat> That's a substantial pile and it extends for um, kilometers uh, along, along its length. So moraines uh, are major features that uh, are made of this mixture of boulders and mud um, that mark the location uh, where ice pauses for a while. There are also things we'll see in a moment called eskers, and these are the ice tunnel deposits. This is just a, a picture of one of the most famous edges of a moraine, what's left of it today, Great Hill in Kennebunk. I'm glad I took that picture in 1983. Very complicated moraine. Mains, moraines should be just a pile of sand and gravel and mud. This one is not, it's layered. This bottom part is a pile of sand and gravel and mud. <clears throat> it's called a lodgement till. You can't stick a pen, a pen knife into that. I mean, it had more than a mile of ice resting on it, squeezing most of the water out. Very difficult thing to, uh, to dig through. But above it is marine clay. And again, the ocean came in as the ice was retreating and there were things living in it. And so there's shells in there that have been dated to about 15,000 years old. These were the first dates on the age of uh, deglaciation in the Northeast came from this outcrop. And above it, I've been at, I was at more than one field trip. We came here and it's not my area of study, but they debated the origin of this other thing. Is it a till? Well, it's not, it's not like a lodgement till. You can, you could, you could kick this, you could shovel it, but it, it is a mixture of things. Nobody's quite sure whether the ice had retreated and then just readvanced a little. We really don't know too much about that. Finally, the whole thing is capped with a, uh, with a contemporary soil. <clears throat> so we go back to, to looking at this, and again, the eskers are, are very prominent. Um, they're ice tunnel deposits. I got a chance a number of years ago to work in Glacier Bay and, and map the bottom using some geophysical equipment, but in the boat, it was just incredible to see this, this mud coming out of ice tunnels and just floating. It's just so brown. If you stuck your hand in it, it disappeared. You wouldn't, you put it in up to your wrist, you would not see your fingers. It was that thick, and yet it's still... <laughs> less dense less dense than ocean water so it floats on top of it and you can see how the one has been the it's flowing under the ocean here and so icebergs are being scraped off so these are the kind of features that were in maine and that define that defined a lot of our uh, glacial features that's just a picture of an ice tunnel where it's active probably about 75 80 feet deep here and that is coming out oh see the water is two or three meters 10 feet per second really fast moving. This in Alaska is coming from about 5,000 feet high. It has boulders. We were watching boulders the size of basketballs come out 100 feet or more. And there are a number of, I was in a, a National Park Service boat and we were pretty safe. There were kayakers trying to get closer to it. It's kind of kind of crazy. But what came out of that sort of deposit is what you see on the lower right, glacial marine mud. Um, this is in Brunswick, Maine, um, McCoyt Bay. It's about... Um, 30, 35 feet high, thick deposits here. This must've been fairly near an ice tunnel, although it's never been, nobody's ever mapped it. But this material just was dumped on the landscape and it filled low areas. Any area that was low tended to be filled and smoothed out. So existing river valleys were blocked. Uh, we say that they, the rivers were, the, the drainage was deranged meaning it's just gone crazy. It's, it's none of the original drainage is, or very little of it is present. Uh, it's it, <clears throat> when the ice melted, rivers had to find new channels. So when you look at a river, wherever you live, 
<clears throat> you're not looking at an old feature like the Mississippi River. You're looking at something that formed after the Ice Age. Um, the youngest rivers in, in the United States are in uh, in Maine or in, or in Alaska. So the weight of the ice, again, um, a mile thick, pushing down the crust of the earth, allowing the ocean to flood inland. This is just a map a, a graduate student of mine made a number of years ago of the Orono Bangor area, really going out and mapping the edge of the of the, the glacial marine mud. And you can see we had a very different um, geography in those days um, and a very different oceanography, the circulation, the movement, <clears throat> excuse me, the tides, profoundly different. None of this has really been worked out very well beyond knowing it was very different once. This just shows the marine limit, the most landward extent, this yellow line up here, the most landward extent of uh, of the ocean in Maine. Um, now, there were islands sticking up the Camden Hills and Cadillac Mountain were certainly stuck, stuck up above it. I won't go into the sea level history very much other than to say we reached the high stand and then we fell, the land emerged tremendously and we fell to a low stand about 200 feet or 60 meters below present that I've mapped out, out here in the lower area. So this is Maine's greater coastal zone, if you would. And Mary Meeting Bay is uh, right about in dead center. Some of the ways we, we've seen this, the, the, the marine limit, the most landward extent, there are deltas. Uh, Columbia Falls Delta you see here. This is the Ellsworth Delta. And this is a, a delta, you know, in a puddle, uh, you know, in a, you know, in a little gravel pit. But what you can see is the same as what you see here. Here are the top set beds, the very top, the river beds. Here they are in this uh, cross section here in this gravel pit, and they're on the surface here, and there are channels <clears throat> marking where the rivers had flown. Then, when the river got to the edge of of the ocean, you can see the old shoreline. Oops, so oh, I didn't mean to do that. Am I going to be able to go back? I'll stop. I won't. I won't even try. I think I'll get lost. It might. It won't reverse for me. So um, we know the deltas were there. They helped us. We 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 use those deltas to mark the the highest end and later the lowest end of the sea. The eskers I mentioned because they are in and around um, uh, Mermaiding Bay. You can see the one on the right here with a road on top of it. It's the high area. It's really swampy on both sides. Lakes, eskers are just everywhere in this state. They're just elongate bodies of sand and gravel that were tunnels in the melting ice. Really nice one over here in, in Old Town. This is just a map showing the esker deposits, these, these reddish colored lines. And then, and then uh, on it, I, I superpose the, the river drainages of the state. Here's the Kennebec coming down here. And I wondered, were these eskers <clears throat> you know, did modern rivers emerge from where these eskers had formed, where the ice tunnels were? And yeah, in the in Mary Meeting Bay area, in the Augusta area, you could tend to think so. Um, and up along the Kennebec Valley on the right, you can see a picture. It's right near the Kennebec River. It's an esker. And here where I live in Orono, um, I'm just, just down here a little bit, but there's an esker here along um, um, Bennick Road, right along the Stillwater. But in other areas, there seems to be little relationship between these ice tunnel deposits or eskers and um, existing rivers, particularly in this area. And that is not clear at all. There have been so many arguments as to why that isn't so. Something very important changed that caused <clears throat> the ice tunnels to reorient themselves toward the east more than following the river valleys. But nobody has ever uh, has ever discerned that. I couldn't help but show this one. I, I didn't collect it. This is offshore of Kennebunkport. The, so this is deep water, it's underwater, and it's called a multi-beam bathymetric image. The deepest area is about 60, about 200 feet deeper in purple, uh, getting shallower into the blue, the blue, the yellow, uh, the green, the yellow, and then the orange is fairly shallow, and that's an esker. And sea level fell to a point way off here to the right, at its lowest stand and actually came across all of this and reworked it. You can see lots of little beaches still extant out there from when this was the coastline, but but that was long ago and that is now submerged. Final part of the ice age was uh, Aeolian wind. Um, the vegetation, there was no vegetation, the ice had left. It was still in Canada and <clears throat> the ice was cold. So the air on top was dense 
and dense air likes to go down, and so it flowed down the face of the ice at extremely high velocities, called catabatic winds, hundreds of miles an hour. And any anything the, the, that that wind came in contact with tended to blow, but especially sand and dust. So we have dune sand, Lurus is windblown dust, and it's common uh, throughout the state. The desert of Maine is the most commercial example, but there are there are other such places uh, all all around. And that kind of ended our glacial conditions. This is just a picture of some of the dunes. They're, they tend to be on the eastern side of rivers um, or lakes. It was in Greenbush on the eastern side of the Penobscot. It was a housing development going in, so we got a nice look at this lovely wind bloom deposit. Well, then we come down to Merrimini Bay, and the, what here is called the Brunswick Sand Plain. It is glacial marine mud at the bottom with windblown sand over much of the top. You can see an outcrop uh, that's exposed here near uh, Wharton Point on McCoy Bay. These big, long, sloping <clears throat> um, layers uh, were windblown sand dunes with the glacial marine mud uh, beneath it. Well, that's what lies beneath uh, Bowdoin College and this whole Brunswick sand plain. And what is important about what we're talking about <clears throat> is that um, these deposits block the Androscoggin River and the Kennebec River from finding their way to the ocean, which was going to be probably in McCoit Bay, in Casco Bay, maybe Middle Bay. That's where they wanted to go. That that's that's where there is a low I mean, hundreds of feet deep bedrock valley, but they couldn't get there because of all this, all the most recent windblown sand, and so the rivers became deranged. They no longer could flow in their ancient courses, and this is true for all the rivers in the state, for one reason or another. So here are some of the major, the major rivers in our region, the St. John and the Merrimack. Um, are the biggest, and they're not really strictly in Maine. The Kennebec weighs in, well, the, the, it's called the Kennebec because it goes to the sea near Popham Beach as the Kennebec, but it's really the joint kennebec androscoggin which some to 433 cubic meters per second of average discharge, but I'm in the Penobscot, and I like to think that we have the largest individual river in the state at 342 cubic meters per second. Um, but all of these rivers are are not in entirely in their ancient um, river valleys. Here, this is one, this is the Androscoggin. This is the Androscoggin's ancient river valley. This is near Bethel. You can see what a huge, broad valley it is and widened by glaciers. But this is where this river has come from um, for a very long time, perhaps millions of years, probably millions of years. But others aren't like that. Uh, here's Orono. Um, this is the uh, the Penobscot River. Here's the Stillwater River, and I'm right over right here on the side. <clears throat> and you can see rocks crop out across it. Rocks shouldn't go across a river just before it enters the ocean. I mean, any river worth its uh, that's been around for a while. Um, again, I, I use the Mississippi, but it could be any of the rivers in the South have long since um, eroded away any. Um, rapids or waterfalls where they near where they enter the ocean. Uh, those are reserved for the mountainous areas that they haven't quite gotten to. But here we find it right as this is actually coastal is tidal down in here. Um, right there because the river was never here before. It hasn't had time to to erode these materials. So um, we have different kinds of drainage systems in the state, um, but <clears throat> they've all been altered a bit. I'll just show a couple examples. Here's Machias, uh, then down East Main. Machias Bay is off to the lower right. Here's the Machias River going over its waterfall as it enters its estuary. It just You tell this to friends of mine that, that work in the South and they just, they're shocked to hear about something like that. But this isn't the river that carved Machias Bay. It's over here, it's called the Middle River. It's hundreds of feet deep before you get to bedrock. Not much there now, it's mostly a wetland because it's blocked by glacial marine mud. And so river was never able to reoccupy that. Instead, it found a new channel and, and it's trapped. It really can't change today. The Saco down in southern Maine, the Saco River is also deranged. The major drainage that carved uh, Saco Bay was not the Saco River. It was up here where the Scarborough River is. And again, the Scarborough River you see on the lower left here, the biggest salt marsh in Maine is hundreds of feet to bedrock. It, it's, it was a deeply carved valley, and it continues with good continuity right through Pine Point over here, 
into a deep rock valley that extends well into the Gulf of Maine. So a der another derangement. Uh, the Four River, I could go on with all of our rivers, but I'll just, I'll end with this one. But the Four right here in Portland, big looking estuary, but really there's no fresh water. There's nothing coming into it. It's It, it, it would have the Presumpscot River uh, waters, the Presumpscot River's over here in near Scarborough, but a landslide blocked the Presumpscot uh, a long time ago, we don't know when, and diverted it off to now, off to Falmouth, where it enters the sea, leaving its mouth, which was the Four River, really without any headwaters. So again, derangement, It's it's been profoundly altered. Uh, I guess the Cousins was the last river. Again, the Cousins and um, the Royal River, right next to one another. The Royal River is rocky, rapids just before it goes over falls, right under the interstate highway. But you go by the Cousins River a little earlier, it's a big salt marsh. Again, it's 50 meters, 150 or more feet to bedrock. This is the original river valley that was in this area, but filled with glacial material. Uh, I guess I did one more. Um, Marsh River. This is the Penobscot as it nears the, its mouth near Bucksport. Um, and you can see the Marsh River over here. Marsh River is here, hundreds of feet down. It's blocked from getting to the ocean by a big delta, the, the, the glaciers formed up in this area. Here's Bucksport over here. This was never a river valley before. Um, it is today, but the original river valley and with its very deep bedrock channel is over here by the Marsh River. <clears throat> um, just as a reminder to myself, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about a major event that affected Merrimeeting Bay and the Kennebec River. Um, as the glaciers were melting, they melted from the south um, east to southwest, the south generally toward the northwest. And so there was ice up here in, in northern Maine, even as Portland had completely deglaciated. There's no ice at all. When ice leaves, melts away from the crust, the crust vertically comes up very, very quickly, inches a year, uh, very noticeably, sometimes with earthquakes. So um, Portland and the whole coast had, had arisen. This area might have still had ice. Moosehead Lake is right here. And I was really interested in it because it would have had the effect of the, the weight of the ice pushing down on the Earth's crust on its northern side with its southern side by Greenville uplifting. And so... I hypothesize that this uh, lake used to drain into the Penobscot until the, the, the land in the Northwest uplifted and then drove the, the drainage of the of Moosehead Lake into the Kennebec, which significantly um, altered that drainage. <clears throat> um, here you can see on the right-hand side here, here's Moosehead Lake. This is the superficial geology map. These blue deposits, are <clears throat> higher than present lake beds. So these were lake bottom beds that emerged um, when this area was uplifted and when the the water of uh, Moosehead Lake was driven into uh, the Kennebec River where it could come down to, uh, to Mary Meeting Bay. Uh, this is the man who helped study him, Greg Balco is one of my graduate students. We walked up here to, to demonstrate this and here is where we looked at this was the old outlet of Moosehead Lake into the Penobscot. Greg is standing on it here and it's 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 down in, in this area. Um, and we were fascinated. We wanted to know when it happened because it would have been a major event in the state's uh, river history. So we used a tool called ground penetrating radar. We walked across this, this bug infested wetland a million times dragging a, a device similar to what police use to catch speeders, except it sends radar signals into the ground. So here is the Earth's surface right across on this white line. Uh, and then the radar goes down and reflects off different layers, layers of different wetness, different size materials, different hardness. And we could outline a, a very clear river channel here that was infilled with the peak that you see forming out here. We went out there and collected a core from that peat, and <clears throat> mostly it is peat, until we got down farther. Again, this was a major channel where Moosehead Lake drained through here into the west branch of the Penobscot, but around 8,850 or so years ago, it had tilted too far, and the, the drainage began to move toward the Kennebec, 
and this area switched from a river deposit to just plants, just plant remains, peat, pure peat. So that, that was a major event. Uh, I, I, it's a whole other talk, but if you go down the Penobscot more, suddenly the Penobscot River lost its drainage. Um, here was the west branch of the Penobscot, 102 cubic meters per second. Yeah, the Kennebec, um, you know, had this, this was before the change, but once that changed, the west branch of the Penobscot lost 50% of its, uh, its drainage. Um, uh, over here on the Forks and in Waterville, there was a tremendous increase in the drainage. So water began pouring out into the Kennebec River. And the effect was, it's just hard to really think about it. These things don't happen very often, but um, that's a large change, meaning the river could had to widen itself. It could cut deeper and faster, and it could transport a lot more sand and mud. Um, this is just to remind me that um, the snowpack up here is a big deal up in the mountains. April is the time when it mostly melts. And so that snowpack in, in April's now comes down the Kennebec, but it, virtually all of it used to go down the Penobscot. Um, and so this was a, a very, very large change. Mary Meeting Bay would have definitely found uh, something was going on here. Some of the evidence for this that had actually been observed decades before, but nobody really understood what it was. You know, on the right, I, I, draw, a, I draw a cartoon and you can see bedrock in red and some glacial till here, and glacial marine mud, and then <clears throat> dune material. Um, and the river starts carving into it and me meandering from one side to the other over time until it cuts its way down until it gets to bedrock where it, where it is today and it can't go any deeper. But then on top of this, enigmatically, there is a sand and gravel deposit. And it doesn't make any sense. The river was gone. How did it get there? We now attribute this sand and gravel deposit to the, the catastrophic flood from when Moosehead suddenly started depositing its waters down the Kennebec River uh, and, and leaving um, the Penobscot River behind. And so we, we find these. Here's a picture of them over here. We went to the North Anson Town dump just to see it. Great place to see things. This is late sand. That would be this material here that's accumulating on a terrace and then glacial marine mud below it. Um, so this was a big uh, shot of material. This is just a picture of the gravel pit and that's where, where that is. I'll just show this and I never, I always repeat it when I show it to classes. We walked down here, we walked right across here. We were gonna come over here to look at this. We could see it. A fellow named Tom Weddle with the Maine Geological Survey was walking you know, three feet in front of me, right here. He went right up to his waist in quicksand without even a blink. Just, we, we were shocked, he was shocked. We grabbed him and really had trouble, but, but eventually dragged him out. Um, so whenever you go in a gravel pit, that look dry as can be, we're professional geologists. Gravel pits have, um, have, have water beneath the surface and you can fall into quicksand there very easily. So be careful. So we see, we see this, what's called off-lap sand, the sand then that, that came down the river um, with the, the release of water, water from Moosehead Lake. It's on all the outcrops you see here, it's been mined in Augusta, glacial marine mud. They mine most of the sand. Here it hasn't been mined, it actually is being, it was being mined, but the sand above the glacial marine mud down below. And this then marks that, that, that event that was very important um, in, in Maine's geological history. So here we are coming down here. Uh, this is an old picture. That's the old Edwards Dam. I worked for the state then, and uh, I had equipment like you see down below here. And the governor wanted to know, I think it was, I think it was Angus King, wanted to know, called us together to, to see if this was true. He remembered this illustration from when he was in, in college. He said, yeah, dams trap sediment. Is there hundreds of years of polluted sediment behind the Edwards Dam and other dams that were, they were planning to take out? So here I went in with a device, uh, it's called ground penetrating radar, as I showed in the, in the Moosehead area. And we were in a boat and it sends sound uh, radar down and it reflects off the bottom. Here we couldn't get very deep penetration. You see is these little uh, V, upside down V shaped things. These are boulders, these are large boulders, uh, five or six feet high that, that just completely hardened the bottom 
of the river. There's no mud being, no mud or sand being trapped behind any of our rivers. Every river I've examined is, is like this, a really hard bottom. Because when we get floods, our, our dams are called run of the river dams and the water just water in the sand just go over the top and keep on going downstream. So this was an opportunity for sand to continue down to um, Merry Meeting Bay. <clears throat> And this is the best example I have of, of some of that sand. This is the channel of the Kennebec River, where I, if you're at the bottom of this image, and you were looking down, again, you're looking down in the water column. Maybe I should explain this. Here's the track of the boat going from left to right, and it sends sound out to the right, sound out to the left, about a football field to either side, and the sound bounces back, and, and the device rectifies an image as we travel along. So you could see some of these, these major ripple forms. This is a fathometer track up here on the top, directly beneath this center line. So as we go over these huge sandbars, these are, uh, whew, I'm just guessing about eight, 10, 15 feet high, giant sandbars with smaller ones nested between them. This is the sand that has made it down through Merry Meeting Bay and is on its way to form Popham Beach. So there's a lot of sand uh, got over our rivers and it has come down and it's just a phenomenal quantity here. And where did it go in the end? It went offshore. Here's Cape Small, Popham Beach, Reed Beach State Park. The yellow you see is sand. The green is gravel. The red is bedrock and the, and the blue is mud. The sand and gravel is a delta. We call it a paleo delta. There's no longer a delta active. But there was, as after the Ice Age and when material, when water started pouring down the Kennebec River from the Moosehead, it formed a whole series of lobes. You can see we've color coded them over here that formed sequentially at different times. A uh, PhD student of mine, Walter Barnhart, uh, did his dissertation there. So we can now, we could date these, we could start to relate the timing of formation of the Kennebec River Paleo Delta to the timing of the um, <clears throat> the change in the drainage of Moosehead Lake and, and material coming down the Kennebec River. So um, here we are, uh, blocked. Um, Merry Meeting Bay is here. The river really wants to go that way, but as I said before, it can't. And so it goes out the chops. Oops, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Darn, I'm twitching. No, I don't even want to click it again. But it goes down through the chops uh, and it goes out to sea. And, and it goes to that low stand, the river would drop 200 feet vertically below the level of the chops. And so the chops were a waterfall, probably 100 feet high. It'd be really interesting to look on the downside of the chops because almost certainly, I mean, it's probably covered with sand, but it would have been carved down as a, as a canyon, really, down about 200 feet lower than present to allow the river to go out all the way, way out to sea to form the Kennebec River Paleo Delta. So Merry Meeting Bay, uh, that's basically how it, 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 it has come to be in its place and um, an artifact of some unusual bedrock that happened to come together, two streams that got diverted from getting to the ocean and were backed up into uh, the bay and will be there for the foreseeable future. In our lifetime, the bay will, the rivers will never cut through, um, through Brunswick. I left this up as my, uh, I think it's my last slide, as a um, as an advertisement. I, I've written a book that's a, a title, that's the cover of draft cover photo. It's been, it's been sent to a publisher, but these slides and many others, a whole description of how the Maine coast has vertically changed its elevation over the years is written up in this. And I urge everybody to buy two copies at least. Okay, I'll end with that right there. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, that was great, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure you just sold a lot of books. Uh, <laughs> this is even better. Um, well, but that'd be fine. That'd be fine. So um, I, I've got a, no no one has there was one question in the chat room. I, I've got a question just back at a, a slide that you probably can't get to easily, but it's so it's the one with six uh, images of the uh, where the ice was receding at different times. Yeah, I'm, uh, and the oldest one had a uh, is about fifteen thousand, fifteen and a half thousand years ago, I think. 
Um, just to clarify, there were a bunch of little orange crosses on that, a bunch of white dots. What were those? And yeah, that's the slide. And, and what was the seaward extent of the ice? Was it just same as the continental shelf? Or where, where, how far out did it go? It went out to George's Bank, seaward of Maine, and there are moraine deposits in moraine, the terminal moraines there. But in the northeast, it went as far south as Long Island. And you know, there's those two forks at the eastern end of Long Island. They were each two separate moraines where the ice went out, moved back a little, and then formed another one. Uh, in fact, what it did is really scoop out Long Island Sound and push it up and make it Long Island. Um, it also connected over to uh, Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, and then it jumped to Cape Cod, and then a series of smaller moraines as it came up. Maine, we have no real record of it till about 15,000 years ago when it gets to the coast. And these dots are of two sorts. Uh, one indicates an actual date that indicates a, a marine sediment probably where we are, but sometimes trees in these other areas where something was established, that was the date of when the ice was there. Um, and the others are places where people have written papers and described this material. Okay. So, so, so Maine started to get uncovered about probably 16,000 years ago. Is that one of around 50, I'd, I'd say 15 would be a better uh, better number, just, just to be. Now, again, you'll see 13,000 years ago, ice margin. That's radiocarbon date, but we know radiocarbon isn't exact. And it, as the farther back you goes, you go the farther it, it it's removed. But people have studied tree rings, particularly in Europe, going back tens of thousands of years and have calibrated the radiocarbon. So if you get a radiocarbon date, it, it, and when you pay for it, it'll automatically be calibrated to what the calendar year would be. So the calendar year here uh, on, on Maine losing its ice is 15,500 years ago, even though the radiocarbon date would be 13,000. And that's confusing, I know, but when you look at older papers, they didn't know how to calibrate things. And so you'll see these, these much younger ages that aren't correct at all anymore. Um, there's a few questions in the chat thing here, and I just screwed mine up, so I don't really know how to work this very well, but... Um, um, Let me think. Chat? Oh, okay, I've seen it. Someone's okay. asking what explains the shape of Mount Kineo. And uh, also, is there any particularly interesting about the sediment, sedimentary patches that you showed earlier? Okay, uh, what the shape of Mount Kenya? Yes, Mount Kenya um, <clears throat> has. If if you if you go there, it's in Moosehead Lake. It has a, a long, gentle ramp that faces the northwest, and then it's a near It is a vertical drop um, as you go to the to the southeast. And that's, it's called a ramp and pluck. There's a lot of glacial names, but the glacier just ramped up over that and it got to the edge of the rock there. It's volcanic rock and um, water melted from the bottom of the ice, got into the ice, into the rocks and the rocks just plucked them off, giving you a vertical face. So that's, um, that's the shape. It's an unusual shape, but if you go to Mount Desert Island, Acadia National Park, you'll see something very similar to it, uh, Almost all of the mountains there show something very much like that. And now somebody has written in here, uh, just south of the chops, the river is about 120 feet deep, whereas the river on average is about 40. Yeah, okay, well, that's great. I appreciate that. I've, I've never really looked, but below where 120, it probably goes down deeper to bedrock. And again, this is the fact that um, Mary Meeting Bay was probably a lake uh, at that point. The chops um, probably represented a waterfall. Uh, and so there would have been a, I, I don't know that anyone's ever looked for lake deposits surrounding Mary Meeting Bay. I would not be surprised if there were some dating from that period of time when when the chops really limited how much water could get out of the area. Well, as as, as they still do, and that's that sort of goes back to that initial slide I had that the residence time where time water spends in the bay is really long. Um, because it's it's difficult to get out of, and if it does get out, it comes back. It comes um, back. That's right. I mean, strictly speaking, it's not a great estuary. Estuaries are area with salt and fresh water mix. There isn't a lot of salt water mixing in there. There, there can be some at times, but uh, but it's mostly a fresh water mixing basin. It's really unique. There's nothing like it any place I I can think of. 
I see somebody has asked here, uh, also, is there anything particularly interesting at those sedimentary patches I showed earlier? Both look hikeable. They are definitely hikeable. You could walk on them. Um, yeah, it's interesting. They're sedimentary rocks. They're sandstones for the most part, and they have fossils, um, and they represent probably deposits that formed, think back to the Himalayas. They were in that kind of terrain then when they were small, not small, but large mountain valleys that would accumulate material that fell down the sides of the mountains. That's what those are. So they're kind of interesting in that sense. Um, Seth had a question. He missed it. Could you repeat your estimate of the highest and lowest water levels as compared to today? Oh, on in Mermeading Bay? Yeah. I'm guessing the lowest, it was never really lower unless we had a, an extreme drought, something really dried up the rivers <clears throat> around 6,000 years ago. It was very dry. I don't, I've never seen a, a, a core. Again, I couldn't get my equipment into the bay to pour it. So I, I didn't, I didn't get to do that. Uh, highest, I, I would have thought maybe about 12,000 years ago when there was a lot of water available for melting ice still and the chops just couldn't really accommodate enough of it. Um, and so it backed it up and we would have had a, a back backwater area there. So, so even then, do you think it, it, I remember hearing some, some talk about it maybe did drain out through the Brunswick sand plains. Um, it, 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 not near the surface, because that's windblown sand. We can't really see down into it. But if mm -hmm. you went down, it would be interesting. In fact, we have remote sensing devices that could look down. That would be an interesting thing to look at. I, I don't believe anybody ever has. It's plausible. It might not have, but it could have. Mm -hmm. I've heard I've talked talk that or hypothesizing that the chops may have been plugged up with, you know, remnant ice for a while. It, it probably wouldn't have been too long, but at some point, you know, that would have then diverted, you know, maybe diverted water elsewhere or maybe just came out underneath the ice. You know, I, I don't know. Um, well, certainly. And, and when, you know, it was cold winter, you would have frozen it up and it might have very well have frozen the chops. I mean, it was a colder time then. Yeah. And so you, if spring came, you would have gotten some pretty serious water. Um, I'm seeing a lot of these things. How does salinity vary from Gardner, pretty much fresh water, to Bath? Bath um, <clears throat> near the surface is uh, is pretty fresh water. But as you go down deeper, you can get incursions of ocean water on high tides. Um, so anything from you know near shore ocean salinity to fresh water up in Gardner. I, I can speak to that a bit for, for Mike. Um, Years ago, when we did our current study, we were out running around with a salinity meter around the bay with the USGS folks, and uh, salinity was anywhere from like zero to three three parts per trillion there, or per, per thousand, and seawater is thirty five, yeah. um, give, give or take. And and the the uh, only gentleman uh, who was it, Larry, somebody I believe, who who came up here, from, he's from UNH, came up with a with a good size ship up the Kennebec a number of times, and he found that salt wedge coming up the Kennebec to kind of come as far as Swan Island, uh, lower end of Swan Island. Okay, okay. So, and and my, my take on it is that that only probably happens a few times a year in times of really low river flows and a really high tide. Because really the salinity seems to be really uniform around the bay and yeah. it is super, 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 super low. Yeah. Yes, no, that's, that's not really um, surprising. Someone asks, is there any good material or how to look up uh, bath area geology. There sure is. If you go on the website to the Maine Geological Survey, that's a state agency, go to state government and type Maine Geological Survey, you'll get to their website. They've got, oh, voluminous quantities of educational materials, teaching, instructional materials. Uh, you can find out, well, there, there any map that was ever published uh, on, on the bath area geology is there and is downloadable and is free. And Elementary school teacher wants to know, answer the question, how was the river created? <laughs> okay, the, the more interesting question is, when was the river created? It was covered by a mile of ice, so there was no river there then. I guess it wasn't created, but there was a channel somewhere where there had previously been a river before the Ice Age. It's been about, a, we've had many Ice Ages, um, about every 100,000 years for the past couple million years. And so there, there are channels, um, so if you wanted to say it was created oh, 12,000 years ago, because that's when you could you could go down the river all the way into the, you know, to its offshore delta. Okay, that would have been a that's a fair answer. 
Um, but the Bedrock Valley, at least of parts of it, um, and Merry Meeting Bay is part of it, would have formed probably over the last 100 million, 50 to 100 million years. Um, but So for a very long, it takes a long time to carve a, a deep bedrock valley. And so I'm just guessing that, but a long time. Art, Art had a question here. I wondered if you could show that slide near the end of the chops again. Uh, chops, yeah. Uh, near the end of your presentation. Was it the end? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll just throw out a, a fishy fact for folks here that we've talked about some some long time periods here and, and you had some great slides of how, where the continents were. Uh, most people think of sturgeons as dinosaur fish. You know, they've been around 250 um, uh, thousand years or so. A million, probably a million. They, a million, million, very million, old. Yeah, million, yeah. And, uh, and but lamprey have been around more like 450 million. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. Those nasty guys. Well, here's an image of the chops. Uh, that's a picture I took flying over it once. In fact, when I was there, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I wasn't there to take a picture of that, but the bay was mostly frozen then. And you can see where it comes out up here on the map. And basically, that was the easiest place the water could get through. It really, there was never a channel. This this present channel going through Bath, here's the doubling bend, um, didn't exist as this river channel until this area was blocked and the river just, so after the last ice age. And the river, you know, had to had to find another way. It was lower and easier to get through the chops than it was to get through Brunswick. Okay, great. I think I think that you went through most of the questions there again. I, I, uh... Beth Berry had one question for those of us who live. He asked about sea levels, high and low sea levels, which we. Oh, here we live near the bay. How high was the has the sea level been over the land we now call home? The Bay, oh, Merrimean Bay. How high was it? Okay, um, 75 meters. What? What's 75 meters? Uh, 180, 190 feet. So maybe even almost, I don't know, no, more than that. 250 feet, something like that. Quite, quite deep. Would have been big icebergs floating in it. Um, ratio of feet to ice. Okay, if you... If if you so if every three feet of ice pushes the Earth's crust down one foot, that's just a it's just a rule of thumb. The specific gravity, if you want to think of it as a density of rock, um, <clears throat> is about three times that of ice. So you need a lot more ice to equal the same weight of 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 crust. So it has to be about three feet of of ice to push the crust down one foot. And then someone's asking if there are changes, evidence of changing river flows prior to the ice ages. No, we would have no record of anything like that. Um, it, the ice age really wiped the slate clean. Barbara Vickery says to assess question, which I think was about sea level, not Merriming Bay. Uh, high stand, yeah, that's, well, high stand, it depends on where you are. The ice was a lot thicker in toward uh, Millinocket than it is it was on the main coast. And so the, the crust was pushed down quite a bit farther there. Uh, I'm remembering 415 feet being the height of a particular delta in Medfield. But it's much, wasn't nearly so deep right on the immediate coast because the ice was never that thick to push it down. When it was that thick, there was no ocean to come in and flood it because the ice uh, sat on it and blocked it. Questions like these are always very hard to answer, really, because it just hasn't been studied. This would be a great place to 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 have a master student or even a PhD student do a thesis. Just uh, I was just blown away by the logistics of getting in there with a a boat that can carry the kind of equipment we work with. But that's the kind of equipment that you would like to, to drill a hole down and uh, it, it, it'll wait a. A pontoon you, boat or something. You, you just need an you just need an old Androscoggin scow. You know? <laughs> Perhaps we do. Perhaps that. I was thinking a uh, uh, a catamaran, but yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, if someone speculates, I wonder if the New Meadows may have been an old exit channel for the Kennebec. But um, Art Art Spies, uh, uh has a great uh, end, ending uh, piece, uh, and he's asking when uh, when will your book be available. 
Well, I would say right to the University of Maine uh, uh, publishing uh, outlet and, and ask them to accept it. It hasn't been accepted yet. I've submitted it. They're going to tell me this month if it were accepted today. I'm sure, despite I think it's brilliantly written, I'm sure I'm going to have weeks of edits uh, to go through and change. Uh, and so it would probably come out um, I know they would like it to come out by summer because that's when people buy books like that for the summer. Certainly by next Christmas, probably by ne maybe by next summer. No, it, it won't be long, geologically speaking. Geologically, it's it's yeah, no, it's just about to happen. Great. Well, thank you very much. And and uh, again, uh, this this presentation was recorded. And and I thank Martin uh, McDonough very much for for working on this. And he'll have it up on our website in a few days. And, uh, and 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 uh, Joe, thanks so much for being here again. And uh, yeah, um, fortunately, probably neither of us will be here in, in another twenty five years. You know. So, yeah. Well. Well. Yeah, I, I, been late. Joe was one of our first speakers in, in the series back in nineteen ninety seven. So. Uh, well, if I get a chance to go out and do some work there, some new work, I'll, I'll let you know, and we'll maybe yeah. return to that. That would be great, and we can do that. All right. Thank you all for coming. Sure. Thank you. See you next month. Thanks.